and this series, this is part five in the series, and this section of the series is about the will of the Father, the work of the Son, and then the last one is the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to talk today about the work of the Son. A lot of people are confused about what that is, and uh, they're not sure what it is. And uh, I want to tell you that uh, the, the issue with the Son of God is a serious issue. It is, uh, it is the theme of your Bible. From beginning to end, this book speaks of one man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And for you to be able to learn how to speak to people about the Lord Jesus Christ and how to present him and introduce him to people and introduce them to him, it's important that you know some things about what he is doing and what he's already done. So we're going to talk about some of that today and, and what those things are. Uh, the, the, the plan of God, it changes eternally the family of God. So the family of God for eternity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, changed completely when he created the angels and all the creatures the seraphim, the cherubim, and the angels. Then it, it changed again when he created mankind permanently. But the, the reason that it changed permanently is that he himself became a man and forever changed not only mankind, but he changed the Godhead. So the Godhead is never going to be the same as it was before the cross. And it's never going to be the same because he's not the same. Now, it doesn't mean that he's not God. Of course he's God. But he's now not only the Son of God, but he's God the Son. Positionally, he's now taken a new role. And we're going to talk about that today because there is changes going on. There are changes, and those changes began, of course, they began with the plan back here, but they began to really come into focus with the purpose and, and what happened at the cross. Uh, all time begins at Calvary because we, we see that God looks for it and toward it in the planning of it, and then afterwards we look back in it, at it, and, 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 and in what it did. And it's really important that we get to, to get this, this change because this change is an eternal change. This is not something that he does, and then it's, it's over and it goes away. It changes forever the, the, the complexity of everything, especially the family, because this is all about God creating a much, much, much larger family. Now, somebody was asking me about this at camp and about the, uh, the issue of you know, do, do we become God? And they asked me that question, and they were talking about that. And I said, no, we do not become God. The three attributes of God are never given to any creatures, even us. So the attribute of being omniscient, all-knowing, is never given to us. The, the attribute of being omnipresent and being able to be all places simultaneously is never given to us and the omnipotence and the power of who he is is never given to us those three things are retained between god the father god the son and god the holy spirit only however when we're brought into the family of god there are some things that allow us to share in the attributes of his deity and the attributes that he has are number one he's righteous and perfect and holy. We get that when we're there with him in the future. We don't have it now, but we do have it positionally. We also get a brand new body to live in. We don't have a body that deteriorates and dies. We have a body that will endure eternity. And a body, as he says, he fashions it like unto his glorious body, and then we have it for eternity. So therefore you have this brand new body that lives eternally, it never dies, and you're without sin during that time, which is forever. Those are two really important issues, and we all talk about those things, how wonderful that's going to be. But that really is a fundamental change for us. 
it's a it's a not only a fundamental change it's it's a fantastic change and there are other things that go along with it as we've spoken of many times about the duties and the things we're going to do out there the life that we have in christ and all the things that we will be able to accomplish in the heavenly places the the children i got a letter this week from uh one of the young girls from camp that, that came, she was visiting here with my brother and uh, she sent me a thank you letter and and she was talking to me about some things and she had some questions at the bottom of the page and i tell you i read through these questions and i'm going wow this is really good this is not normally the kind of question that i would i would hear from a a young girl that's 12 13 years old she's got some she's got some really good questions and uh so i'm kind of in the process of sending her an answer back answering these things for her the, the idea of learning these things and knowing these things are really important so we're gonna we're gonna give you a thumbnail sketch today just just to get you through the basics on it and most of you already know all this but these four things i want to touch on because they're very very important turn to first timothy uh, chapter one and before we begin let's have a word of prayer together heavenly father thank you for your word and we thank you for your son the lord jesus christ and the work that he's done on our behalf we thank you for it today and it's in his name we pray amen uh, the work of God and the work of the Son, all of these things that we're going to discuss, all have a motive behind them. And when the Lord Jesus Christ did what he did at Calvary, he did it for his heavenly Father. The idea of incarnating into the human race was required because he has to be able to relate to those who are in the human race. He has to have the people in the human race to be able to relate to him. He is called the man, Christ Jesus. So now he is no longer just a spiritual kind of entity that he was in time past as the second person of the Godhead. He is now officially been part of the human race. Now he came into the human race and became a man in a completely different way than we do. We're born in sin. We're conceived in sin and shaped in iniquity, David says. But, but he came into the human race without sin. And that was something that was what we would consider to be a pretty miraculous uh, intervention in human history when he did that. He did that, and it's called the incarnation. He incarnates into the world, and he becomes a man. And he's made a little lower than the angels. And there's a reason for all this. Uh, my pastor taught me years ago, he said, Russ, the Son of God became the Son of Man so the sons of men could be made the sons of God. That's part of God's plan and the, par and the part of His will for the work of His Son. So He is looking, as I said before, to make us all His sons and daughters. When He uses the word son in the Bible, it, it, is always spe it speaks of sons because he speaks to the idea that in a family in general, in this book anyway, and it's still that way in many places in the world, that the firstborn son is the natural heir of the family. And, it, and the responsibility of what the father would do after he died would be left to that first son. And that first son was expected to carry out the will of the father. That's why that relationship had to be so uh, it was so important and had to be so precise because he was going to be in, uh, he was going to be vested and entrusted with the wealth that the father leaves so that the so that his wife and his other children would all be dealt with fairly with equity you see you don't want to leave the leadership behind that's corrupt and that won't take care of your family so Really what sonship is about is about this, this progression of the family and, and this legacy of leadership that, that is there after the man dies. And so the work of the son is to do the will of the father. So when you, when you see this working out in, in this, this formation of this new family, you see that he did this for his father. He did it for you and me also. He certainly came to do what he did for you and me. He did it because there is no other way for it to be done. It can't be done another way. If there was another way 
if Calvary could have been bypassed and he did not have to go there, it would have been done that way. God did not flippantly, you know, put his son on the cross, so let's try this and see what happens. There was no other way to bring the human race back to God. The question is, why did he bother? You know, why not just, you know, blink everybody gone and start over? Well, what's going to happen if you start over? The same thing. And, and, and how do you know that? Well, evidently, he did know that. Because he knows all things from the beginning. So he, he doesn't think like you and I think. He doesn't think just in, in, in kind of linear thinking left to right. If you look in time, when we think about this, you know, time, we move in time like this, right? On a linear line. We move from left to right, don't we? You're somewhere in time, here you are, right? But in the course of your life, time works in cycles. So it, it has a tendency to work like this, right? What month are we in? Everybody's looking at their watch or their calendar. <laughs> it's good to not know the day of the month, isn't it? I love that. Not know the day of the week or the month, whatever. We're in the month of June. And, and I ask people all the time, sometimes we're talking about this, you know, and they'll think I'm nuts. But they say, which way do you move through the year in your mind? Do you move left to right or right to left? When you look at the, all the months of the year at one time, how do you look at it? I used to have a calendar at work, and it was an interesting calendar because it was a, it, I use it for production work, but it was, a, it was a calendar in which January was 31 days across the top in a strip, and then February was right below it, okay? And it was just strips like that. And it took me a while to kind of relate to that calendar because I was always used to seeing these calendars like this. And in my mind, they go through, January starts here, and then February, then March, then April, and you move right to left, all the way around to January again. Well, some people go the other direction, don't they? There's a cycle. The cycle of life in a year is you have... The way our calendar works, you have winter, spring, summer, and fall. Winter, spring, summer, and fall. And there's a cycle. And that cycle continues all the time. And it, it never changes. Uh, turn back to Genesis. <clears throat> Chapter, uh, uh, let me see where I want to go here. I believe this is uh, Chapter 8. This is for all the people who believe in gullible warming. This, uh, this idea of a cycle is presented here. And notice what he says in verse 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart... I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. While the earth remaineth, now notice this verse, 22, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So there's a natural cycle that God has put the earth on, and it's going to continue in that cycle until he's ready to change it. He will change it. Uh, there is a time coming, if you move over at the end of the chart over here, as you go out into the dispensation of the fullness of times, that at the end of the millennial kingdom, when the thousand years is up, this earth, as we know it, is redone. It's, it's destroyed, as we know it, and it's recreated. So there's a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation chapter 22, you can read the whole thing. You get a great picture of it there if you want to read that. There is a, there is a cycle of events that go on. And it's continuing on and continuing on and continuing on. There has been, turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 1 now, there has been a cycle of events that has happened in this world that are now recorded in the Word of God and many of the events in history have been predicted in the Bible. 
And uh, these aren't hokey things like Nostradamus and some of that stuff. This is the real thing. This is predictive prophecy. And the Word of God testifies that it's the Word of God because of this predictive prophecy. And so these things that go on and on and on through these years and the centuries, and then all of a sudden we, we, we see them play themselves out in the Old Testament program, then of course into the New Testament program, we begin to see that these things begin to pop up and they're demonstrated to be fulfillments of these prophecies. When you have prophecy in the Bible, it is that which is what? Foretold. In the future, it's going to happen. Right? And the prophetic word is spoken back here by the prophets and so forth, and they preach about it, and they teach about it, and they say, this is going to happen. In your Bible, King Cyrus the Great was named in your King James Bible 400 years before he was actually born and named King Cyrus. Now they knew somebody that was going to be named King Cyrus, that he was going to be Cyrus, but they didn't know which baby it was. Why? Because only God knew that. So this baby comes along and they name him Cyrus and he becomes Cyrus the Great, the great Persian king. And it is put in the Bible for you to understand and there are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these prophecies and they go all the way to the end and they're all going to be fulfilled, every single one of them. Many of them have already been fulfilled, many of them have not been fulfilled. The scriptures cannot be broken, meaning that God makes sure that he works all things out after the counsel of his own will, regardless of human will. So in this process of human will, what happens? People do what they want to do. They have a choice. So when Adam and Eve made the wrong choice back here in the Garden of Eden, when they made the wrong choice, what were they going to do? Adam could have not listened to his wife. He had the choice. He could have said to the Lord, he said, she needs to be fixed. Okay. <laughs> well, it was his job to keep her from doing the thing that she did in the first place. Because he didn't command the woman not to eat of the tree. He commanded the man not to eat of the tree. She was somewhat confused about the whole thing, if you look at the conversation between her and the devil. But the point is, he wasn't tricked. He went into it with his mind wide open, his eyes wide open, and he followed her right into the whole thing willingly. This was no surprise to God. The plan to take care of this problem was already formed long before Adam and Eve or this earth was ever created. The reason that he did not just destroy them, the reason that he destroyed almost all the population during the flood, but did re retain a remnant in Noah, is all part of his plan. It is a risky thing to create a creature that you want to do what you want them to do, but yet give them a free will. All the people that will go to hell in eternity at the great white throne, all those people that God cast into hell will be cast into hell with Jesus Christ having paid every single sin they ever committed. He paid for it. Now that doesn't mean that, those, that that redemption gets put to their account because their volition that God has given them requires them to believe what the remedy for that problem is. So there is a real important issue here about the incarnation and the issue of redemption. This issue is critical because man has to be redeemed. <clears throat> there is no way that he can redeem himself. There is no way that he can undo 
his, the works of his own sin nature. God does not send anybody to hell for having a sin nature. You're born with that. That's not your fault. But the first four or five years of your life, you're not really accountable because you are not able to understand the issue of sin and volition and so forth. So he doesn't hold babies accountable that way. But once you start to learn about sin, God brings a person to that point of accountability through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the parental, parental help there to train the child in what is right and what is wrong. And as that process goes forward, you begin to show the fruit of an old nature. And the things that people do, I, I, there was a thing I read the other day, a guy was complaining about, talking about the, the, the Ten Commandments, and he says, look, everybody for 2,500 years here, from, he's talking about from Adam to Moses, they all knew that murder was wrong. They all knew that lying was wrong. Yes. That was already well understood. The issue in the Ten Commandments is not letting everybody know that those things were wrong. It's letting Israel know that you're now under this contract with me, and if you do wrong and break these things, you're going to get punished for it. And if you don't do them, you're going to get punished. And you either do it or not do it, whichever it's telling you to do. And then if you don't, you're going to get punished and if you do break this one, you're going to get punished. Now, if you keep the law, you get what? Blessed. Now, how would you like to be under a system like that? That's pretty tyrannical when it comes to a contract. Don't ever sign a contract like that. He tries to get them not to, but they do anyway. They say in their pride, all that thou hast said we will do, and they take on the burden of it, and through that process of showing the world they could not keep it, God has now shown the world to be completely condemned. That's what Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3 does. So Christ needs to come and do what is necessary in the incarnation process, and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and read what Paul says. He says it beautifully. This is why Jesus Christ came into the world. Look at verse 15. He says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save what? Sinners. That should be good news for most people that are lost. He says, Of whom I am chief. God does not leave it to you to be saved on your own. He does not give you a way to redeem yourself from your own sin. He has to come and do it for you. And that's what he does. My point to you is that God did it that way because there was no other way to do it. And the Lord Jesus Christ knew this when he took the job on. Uh, so this idea of, of you know, no, no, no redemption needed, no, no reason for God to become a man, all that sort of thing, this is all hokey pokey. No, it's not. It, it's true. And it was declared to be so in Romans chapter 1. He came into the world to save sinners, and what happened? They crucified him. What was one of the great things that he did to demonstrate that he really was God? Israel's going to realize that Jesus Christ is God one of these days, but it'll be far in the future from where we are now. They'll believe on him eventually. It's going to be a great day in Israel's history when that happens. But in Romans chapter 1, Paul says this. He talks about the gospel of God in verse 1, and then in verse 2 he says, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. That's the prophecy. That's the foretelling of the event. Okay? Then he says, verse 3, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, there's an identification of who he is, verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with what? Power, according to the Spirit of holiness. But how is it all done? Look at the last phrase of that verse, verse 4. By the resurrection from the dead. Where is Jesus Christ? Well, he's not dead. He's been resurrected. He's been exalted. He's been glorified. There is 
redemption in this. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Paul tells the Romans. He says, for it, the gospel of Christ, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, the, to the Jew first and to the Greek there has to do with the order at this time when Paul wrote this in mid-Acts that they were going to the world to tell people about this new issue. And they were to go to the Jews first because the Jews had the contract with God. And that contract had now been made null and void, and he had nailed it to the cross. He kept it for them. And so it was obvious that they would have to have the benefit of the doubt and be told first, you see. So when Paul goes out to preach the gospel, he goes to the Jew first. He goes to the Jew first, all the way through to the end of the book of Acts, and then he goes to everybody equally. There is no difference. But this all had to be explained, you see, and it took a while. He says, verse 17, for therein, he's talking about in the gospel, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. The righteousness of God is not something you can attain on your own. It has to be revealed to you, and here's how it's revealed. It is revealed from faith to faith. Now, was he faithful to go to the cross of Calvary and do the work there? Yes, he was. Jesus Christ did everything his father asked him to do. He did everything he promised to do. As a man, he did what had to be done in the human race through the process of incarnation. And by doing so, he is the only person qualified to make this payment to God, and God accepted it. Look back at Romans chapter 3. In verse 22, or verse 21, I'm sorry. He says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. No more law contract, it's over, it's done. You couldn't keep it, it's over. Forget it. We've proved our point. You couldn't keep it, right? He says, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. They proved by witnessing to it. The prophets preached it. Then what did they do to the prophets? They killed them. Now, if God sends you a messenger to give you a message, do you kill him? Haven't you ever heard somebody say, don't shoot the messenger? We were studying about that this morning with King Saul. And King Saul dies and, and the... the the armor bearer dies with him, and Jonathan is killed. All of them are killed. And, and then the guy comes to tell David about it, and he tells him a little fib, and David's ready to kill him right there for killing Saul. And he says, no, 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 I didn't do that. Oh, man, you don't, you don't make a big story up like that, and you're going to boast in, in doing that. It's wrong to kill God's anointed. You don't do it even if he was a red-headed stepchild in the way he acted most of the time, okay? Saul, was a, he was a real stinker, okay? However, he was still God's anointed king, and King David respected that. And we saw Saul respecting that today, or Paul respecting that today in the book of Acts. You see, there is opportunity for us to understand that Israel's failure is now our benefit. Look at Romans chapter 3 again. He says in verse 22, <coughs> Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of... You see that? That's not faith in, that's faith of. He had to be faithful to go do this. The concept of God, even operating on faith, is mind-boggling to me. But remember this. He was 100% God... And he was 100% man. So he, by faith, obeyed his heavenly father. He, by faith, went to Calvary. He, by faith, did everything that he did. He did it all by faith. And so he, by faith, did that. He says, by faith of Jesus Christ, and it, the results are, in verse 22, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
Well, if you come short of the glory of God, that means you don't get the glory of God. You don't get the glorified body. You don't get to live with him in glory. You have no hope of glory, but you can only see or look forward to the wrath of God. And so that glory of the second coming, that glory of him coming on the horse, on the white horse with the angels, all of that here, you don't want to be around to see that and be standing there as an unbeliever. Lest you be vaporized where you stand because he's going to speak you out of existence with words. Boom, you're gone. And he's telling you here that Jesus Christ did what he did at Calvary by faith. So when Paul says, go back to Romans 1, when Paul says that it's revealed from faith to faith, he's making a transitional statement that shows you that Jesus Christ's faith is what allowed the payment to be made, and for you to appropriate the payment where you live over here today, you must also exercise faith. You must use the volition that God gave you. You must use the thing that separates you from the monkey and all the other animals of the world. Even though they make choices, they do it by instinct. I'm talking about the difference between righteousness and unrighteousness. The difference between right and wrong. Those differences between, the difference between believing in God or a God and believing God and what God has said. It's not enough to believe in God. It won't get you anywhere but hell. You can believe in God or a God, but so does Satan and all the angels and all the devils and all the demons. and all, They all believe in God. They all know who God is. The question is, do you believe what he says? And he says, for there's no difference. For all have sinned and come short. Now notice verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace through... Now notice how it occurs. It, it occurs in verse 24 through the redemption that is what? In Christ. So you get no redemption here without being in Christ. The payment can't go to your account. It cannot be applied to you. And God will not be satisfied. He will not be propitiated until that redemption is applied to your account. That choice that a person makes is the difference between going to hell and spending eternity in God's new family in heaven. Now, I think that that's not oversimplistic. I think that's the beauty of the simplicity which is in Christ and how easy God makes it for a fallen creature to come back to him. He's not going to make it hard for you. He's going to make it easy for you. You pay nothing. You do nothing. He paid everything. He did everything. He did it all here for you. That's not what religion teaches. Religion has you scratching and scraping and, and crying and moaning and praying and reciting and doing all these things until you're, until you're just blue in the face trying to get something that God gives you freely. What's one of the great earmarks of religion in the world? What does religion do more than anything else? What do people do in religion? What do they do more than anything else? other than false piety and hypocritic activity and all that. I'm not talking about how they act, but, but, but this one big thing they do, they kill each other. Wars is what they do. Most all the wars you see are all religious. We're watching this thing play out right now with Islam, and you see how this is done. It's no longer the Islamics against the Jews over there in the Middle East. That's not the problem anymore. The problem is the Islamics are fighting each other. They hate each other. And they've been hating each other ever since Muhammad died. The Sunni and the Shiites became that way after Muhammad's death, and it's been that way all along. Man, if you see two dogs fighting each other, my suggestion is don't try to pull them apart. Stay away. Because you're going to get bit. And we see it time and time and time again. Religious war after religious war after religious war. God is satisfied not with your piety and religion. 
he is satisfied only with what his son did through the death on the cross. Verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through. How is the propitiation obtained? Through faith in his blood. To declare his righteousness for the mission of sins. Not yours. He says that our past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness that he might be just. You see, he can't be just and do it any other way. You're not qualified to make the payment. So, the idea now is the incarnation and the redemption, that becomes part of the work of the Son. He is now resurrected and exalted and glorified, which proves what? Turn over to Acts chapter 17. <coughs> Acts chapter 17, Paul makes this statement. And uh, we had a conversation uh, not too long ago with a gentleman online about this, and he... He was talking about that we're, we don't have to repent today. And I thought, well, here's a verse. Try this one on for size. Look at uh, Acts 17, verse 31. Paul says, because, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man. Who is that man? whom he hath ordained, whereth he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Jesus Christ raised himself from the dead. God the Father raised him from the dead. The Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. He is now exalted and glorified, and he now has the preeminence, meaning he has eminence over everybody. Okay? Whoever has eminence... He's before them. He has preeminence. So that's why he's called King of Kings and Lord of Lords. See, the Lordship issue is he's no longer just the man Christ Jesus who, <coughs> who went to Calvary. He's the ascended, glorified, risen Son of God, and he's now in a position of what? Well, he's in a position of Lordship. Have you ever noticed when you read Paul's epistles how interesting it is that he only uses the word Jesus a few times. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, that sort of thing. He doesn't use the word Jesus like when they're conversing in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they don't call him the Lord Jesus Christ. You know why? Because he's not at that point. He's not yet ascended into the position where he's now considered the Lord in that sense. They called him Lord in a title sense, but he had not, he had not been resurrected yet. He had not been glorified yet. He had not been exalted yet. Do you remember when he took them up on the Mount of Transfiguration and he showed him that, that great vision of him being that way? You know why he did that? Because he gave them a little foretaste over here of what he's going to look like over here in this kingdom. And what did they do? What did Peter do? Peter said... Let's make a bunch of little tabernacles like we do during the Feast of Tabernacles and let's get this thing going. He wanted to turn a religion out of it right then on the spot. He's ready to start worshiping right there. Boom. You know, right in the middle of all that, God said, shut up. Three times he interrupts Peter in mid-sentence in the Bible. That's one of them. He says, don't you dare... Don't you ever put my son on the same level as Moses and Elijah. Because Peter's idea was, let's get three tabernacles. One for him, one for him, one for him. No, that's not what this is all about, Peter. Your theology is a little on the weak side, okay? The country mouse didn't understand the word of God is what it was. And he stuck his foot in his mouth and God said, shut up. Okay, because you don't understand what's going on. Well, he did learn later on. But if you see him talking to, in Acts chapter 10, when he's getting the vision of the sheep, or of the goats, I'm sorry, of the, of the animals, and the four corners of the sheep are let down, and he's getting the idea of the, the unclean and the clean animals, what does he do then? He argues with God too. So when you look at this whole thing, this, this resurrection and exaltation and glorification 
produces for him the preeminent position of king of kings. The lordship is established forever. Look at, uh, look at uh, well, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Take a look at this. I don't have time to go through this whole chapter with you. There are 58 verses of resurrection information in 1 Corinthians 15. It's the longest bit of information on resurrection in your entire Bible. 58 verses. Teaches you the whole doctrine. And it teaches you the whole doctrine in its current position and form. Resurrection is absolutely essential for you because without it, you can't get eternal life. Okay? You can't go and spend eternity with God in the body you've got. And I don't know how many funeral homes you have to drive by to figure that out, but I'm just going to tell you right now, you're not going to make it, okay? You're going to die. And uh, your body's going to die, and then you're going to go somewhere. And uh, there is no such place as nowhere. And so it's important that you learn that, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, notice what he says. Verse 12, he says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Good question, isn't it? He says, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 13, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. So what we're preaching is a lie, and what you've believed is a lie. If, if Christ is not really risen. Yea, he says, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, look at verse 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye, what he says? Ye are yet in your sins. And oh, by the way, verse 18, then, then they which are fallen asleep in Christ, those who have died as former Christian believers, are perished. If it's not true, then where did they go? If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are, all, we are of all men most miserable. Why suffer and preach something that people ridicule? Why go through life trying to convince people and help them understand that Christ died and was buried and rose again for them? Why do you put yourself through all that if there's really not anything to it? Are we all that dumb in this room? that we just love this kind of punishment in our life, that we go tell people about this, and they go, ah, I don't believe that. <laughs> well, Paul says not all men have faith. You can't, you know, if you don't believe it, you don't believe it. That is precisely why people are sent to hell. It's not what the, for what they've done. They get punished for those things when they get sent there, yes, because God does things in righteousness, as Paul just said in Acts 17. He's going he's gonna to let you, he's going to pay you according to you, what you did. So now, look at verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. You see, that's the whole idea of this concept of resurrection life, is that you're going to have this new life with God, and it's going to be real. You're going to actually have flesh and bone bodies that won't deteriorate. This resurrection and exaltation is something God wants you to know about. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> we just got a few more minutes here. We'll be done. Ephesians chapter 1. And Paul's prayer, he prays that you would begin to understand this. In Ephesians chapter 1, he says, man, you really need to get this issue down. So he, 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 he prays for you to be informed and understand here in chapter 1. Chapter 3, he, he prays that you would be empowered by the doctrine. Look what he says in verse 18. He says, the eyes of your understanding, verse uh, 18 of chapter 1, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling. Resurrection hope. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints really is. You know, 
you think, <clears throat> why is he doing all this? Why is he making this new family? Well, he wants one, evidently. But, but the idea is that now he's going to inherit all that's up there through who? Through us. He gets it through us. Because we're the ones that are going up there to fill it in. Fill it up. It's going to be, it's going to be two-thirds empty when God gets done with it. He's going to open the heavens up like a scroll and he's going to shake the thing and all the stars are going to fall and this whole thing is going to fall apart so quick around mankind's head right here that when it's all over somebody's got to be up there to fill those positions and that's, that's why we're doing this. That's why he's doing it and forming the body of Christ. Notice what he says. <clears throat> Verse 19, Paul says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us were to believe? according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be, what? The head, right? Here he's specifically talking about the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. But notice, he has been resurrected and exalted, and, and he's brought up glorified. Notice verse 21 again, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and so forth. So there's nobody in heaven that is above him. You see, uh, this is an interesting thing where, that Paul brings out. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, and you can see this. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and he mentions this. In verse 14, he tells Timothy, Paul's writing this letter to Timothy in verse 14, chapter 6, verse 14, he says, That thou keep this commandment without spot, uh, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a future appearing. Paul talks about all those that love his appearing. That's the first time he appeared to Paul. Okay? This new appearing, this, this new future appearing, isn't this one, it's this one. So he appears here in the beginning of the dispensation of grace, and he appears at the end of the dispensation of grace. Here he appears to, to save Paul and begin the body of Christ. Here he comes to get the body of Christ and take it home. So notice what he says in 1 Timothy. Verse 15. Until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, the end of verse 14, then look at verse 15. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality. Now, if he's the only one that has immortality as a man, and he's the only man that's got it, what are you going to have to do to get it? You're going to have to be in Christ. That's how you get it. You get immortality, that means you're not subject to death anymore. And he says you get that by being in Jesus Christ. So he only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So there's this glorification, this preeminence, this lordship issue. It is settled. The will of the Father. If you wanted to state it simply and concisely, to do the just in a concise statement, it is to make Jesus Christ the Lord of heaven and earth. That's God's big plan in just one sentence, okay? He's going to make Jesus Christ Lord of heaven and earth. That's the plan from the very beginning. That's been the plan all along. And that plan is going to come to fruition. And you're going to see him not only as Lord of heaven and earth, but you're going to see him be the judge of all the earth. That means all of mankind and all the creatures that fell with Satan. They're all going to be judged. Everybody. Look at John chapter 5. 
John chapter 5. Look at verse 21. For as the Father raiseth up the, up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed, notice, all judgment unto the Son. The Lord Jesus Christ, as Paul says in Acts 17, he, had, he has appointed a day whereby he will judge the world in righteousness by that man. That man is the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 4. He tells you this at the end when Paul is finishing his last letter. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, I charge thee, verse 1, 4, 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. What appearing is he talking about? Here and here. So he, there's going to be a judgment for us as members of the body of Christ for service, and then he's going to judge the world over here when he comes back. There's going to be a judgment at the beginning of the kingdom, and then when the kingdom's over, there's going to be the great white throne in which all lost people that have all been funneled into one place are now going to be put in the lake of fire. That's Revelation 19 20. So there's this judgment coming. Uh, look at chapter 2. There's a, there's a way that God is going to judge every man, and it's a fair way. Look at uh, Romans chapter 2. Paul is going to tell you here in Romans chapter 2 that there's a particular issue associated with what he preaches today in the dispensation of grace <coughs> that coincides with how God is going to deal with all men out here. Every person that's ever going to be judged by God will be judged fairly and on the same basic concept. Now get this. Look at Romans 2, verse 16. He says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. What he's saying is that men are going to be judged based upon whether they believed God's word or did not believe it. The rejection of God's word, the rejection of that message that God has for you in this dispensation of grace is the gospel given to Paul. Paul calls it my gospel. Today we teach that people believe that you need to believe that Christ died for your sins. Now that's not the way everybody's going to be they're not going to be judged based on that particular issue in time past, but I can tell you this, it'll be the same principle based upon what he told them at that time they needed to believe. So here Paul says this is what you have to believe today. Back here, this is what you had to believe. Something here they had to believe. Back here they had to believe something different. It's always the same principle though. It's always what did you believe about what I told you. With Adam, he was only asked to not do one thing. Don't eat of the tree. He couldn't even handle that. And by the way, we're all in this because of him. However, God took care of Adam, didn't he? Do you see Adam's redemption pictured there when he brings the goat to the skins? He kills the innocent animal, sheds the blood of the innocent animal, and he does that, and he covers them with that and covers their sin. What is the representation? The representation is he gives his own son, the innocent one, the one who never sinned in word, thought, or deed. He's holy. He's harmless. He's undefiled. He's separate from sinners. He's the son of God. He's God the son. And he gave himself. And that is foreshadowed and portrayed and demonstrated in type all the way back with Adam and his wife. And it never stops all the way through the Bible. 
The issue of redemption is interdispensational. It goes from the beginning to the end. Turn back to Genesis chapter 3, and you can see the promise that it was going to happen. This is called, uh, probably you might remember this from the ETC class, the evangelism training class. Uh, the proto-evangel is what this has been termed in Genesis chapter 3. And he's talking to the serpent. Look at verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. The satanic worshipers of our world, they're, they're always saying hello to one another with a signification of what is typically demonstrated to be a bull, which is that right there. Whenever you see them doing that, that's the sign of the bull. Those who are around the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary, he calls them the bulls of Bashan. Here he's talking to the serpent. He's talking to Satan is who he's talking to. Satan manifests himself as a certain serpent in this particular case, but he's talking about the bull. Okay? When they came out of Egypt, what did they dance around? It wasn't a big butterfly, was it? It was a bull, okay? And there was a, they were sacrificing bulls. And this whole idea, when you see this, is that this is the universal sign today, and you can see everybody using these signs. This is the universal sign of the satanic policy of evil. And most people that put that up probably don't even know that, okay? But they still do it. It's like most people that wear crosses don't understand the meaning behind it. So the idea is, he says in verse 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed, notice, and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So Satan's spawn, which begins here with Adam in the fallen race, it goes all the way through and produces humanity and mankind. In that, within that human race, there is the seed of the woman who begins there with Eve, goes all the way through, finally becoming the seed of Abraham. Here, we see it. And, of course, the seed of David and so forth, and eventually shows up in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He bypasses the sin issue by having a virgin mother. And so what happens is he can incarnate into the human race without the aid of a human father. So the two seed lines that are fighting each other are eventually going to come to blows, and what's going to happen is one is going to overcome the other. So the representation of the seed of the woman, what does he do to the, to the serpent? He crushes his head. That does the serpent in. But in the process of doing that, he, he is killed on the cross, which to him is not a big problem because he resurrects himself from the dead. So that's represented by him just bruising his heel from crushing him. If you ever saw the movie uh, Jim Caviezel played Christ in that thing, the, the Mel Gibson movie about the Lord being crucified? The Passion of the Christ? Well, in that movie, they depicted that by uh, him stomping on the ground, a foot stomping on the ground on that snake. You don't see that very often. The point is, the crucifixion was nothing but a bruised heel to the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's going to be, and it is understood now, to be the crushing of the head of the serpent because that's where he destroys him right there. You know how Calvary destroys that? Because it brings in, it kicks out his two-thirds that are trying to take over in the coup d'etat, and it brings in a whole new family of God up there, and they're all going to hell. There's, a, there's been an eternal battle here going on, and, and we're right in the middle of it right now. Beautifully, right in the middle of it. Watching it unfold. He's going to judge as the Lord of glory. He's going to send them all where they belong. He is the judge of all the earth, as Abraham calls him, and he's going to judge the quick and the dead, those who are made alive and are quickened, like in Ephesians 2, us, we get judged for our service in Christ and those who have already died that are lost, he's going to judge them at the great white throne and his kingdom. 
you see all of this just works itself out as just a kind of a brief example of some of the things, there's just four of them, that really is the work of the sun in this whole thing. It's very important that we understand why Jesus Christ came. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and Paul says, of whom I am chief. I'm leading, I'm leading, or was leading, the group. Many of you have been in groups where you were running with a crowd you shouldn't have been running with, and maybe you were following the leader, and maybe you were the leader. Don't they always look for the leader? Right? Everybody wants to get the leader. And they'll take the little guys, and they'll let them off just to get the big guy, won't they? Yeah. Well, Satan's done. He's over. He knows it. That's why he hates us so much, and that's why he fights against our message and ministries. But I can tell you that uh, God is able to bruise Satan under your heel very easily, Romans 16, 20 says. Uh, Romans 16, where Paul says, uh, may, may, may the God of heaven bruise Satan under your heel shortly. That, that idea of you having victory over this whole thing is based upon the idea that you're in Jesus Christ and he's in you and there isn't anything Satan can do about it. Nothing. What's the worst thing that can happen to you? To not die. <laughs> they said this week that, that women who have children in their late 20s and early 30s, up until 33, when they have their final children in that age group, they're twice as likely to live to 95. <laughs> they're saying that for some reason when women have children at that age group, they become more, they have a better chance of longevity. And my, my, my thought was, why would anybody want to live to 95? You know, this is not fun at that age. Now, I know some people that are hanging on to life dearly and don't want to let go of it because they don't know where they're going to fall, I can understand that. They get a little bit worried. That guy this week, he's, I don't know if you saw him, he's got a 1,500 foot cable that they have these pulley, these uh, cars on. You know, what are those things called? Uh, trolley cars like? They're like a sky lift. And there's a 1,500 uh, it's a 1,500 foot cable and it's about 1,500 feet down to the bottom of the gorge. And this thing's like this, on like about a 30 degree slant. And he's got a bar and he's walking on that thing and he gets all the way up about halfway and the wind blows and starts blowing him and he can't go any higher because he can't grip the thing because it's too steep. So he turns around and he, get, he gets back down and, and he, he failed. He couldn't make, he tried to do it. This is the second or third time he's tried it. There's no net, there's nothing, okay? Just rocks. Is this guy sane or what? He's up there trying to do this, and you say, what is wrong with that guy? Does he have a death wish or what? He likes the adrenaline rush, I guess. I don't know, he's trying to prove something. He's going to prove gravity if he misses it. <laughs> but I don't know what he's going to throw away because I don't know where his soul is, but I can tell you this. You've you, you got to be careful in life. Because you never know where you're gonna, when you're going to go, where you're going to go. It's not when you die or how you die. It's where you go when you die. That's the main thing. You see, sometimes it, it has nothing to do with you or your skills or your advantages or whatever it is you think that keeps you alive. It's completely out of the blue. Okay? And all of a sudden you can be here today and gone tomorrow and we're buying flowers and sending cards and ordering ca caskets and all those things because here today gone tomorrow it pays to be ready doesn't it it does let's have a word of prayer heavenly father we thank you for your word and we thank you most of all for your son that we would consider these things on a daily basis and and remember these things and learn them so that we may better introduce others to the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for it today, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Okay, see you next week.